Welcome to our virtual lecture today. Today we are going to move on in our discussion of the chordata and we are going to move on to the fish who as you know are vertebrates. So we're going to start off there are we mentioned earlier three classes of fish that I want you to be aware of. One of these classes are the Agnatha And then we're going to get into the other two types. These fish are different from the Agnatha because the Agnatha lack jaws and have a few other um, features they are lacking that we'll go into in a few minutes. These other two classes of fish do have jaws and see if you can think what these may be before we, I tell you. We have the Chondrichthyes. And then we also have the Ostea ichthyes. Now before I reveal the true nature of these two fish types, I want you to think about those roots. We've been discussing them all semester. We have Chondra and Ostea, and then we have ichthyes. Now the one you are most likely to recognize right off is Ostea, like osteoporosis. And what does that mean? It means bone. And then ichthys simply means fish. So these are your bone fish. And chondra equals cartilage. So these are going to be your cartilaginous or cartilage fish. Alright, so we are going to start off with our Agnatha and I want you to be familiar with a few key features of these. Um, they do have a cartilaginous skeleton. They have a smooth skin. They do not have scales like the other fish will. And they are jawless which is a very key feature to keep in mind. It's what separates them from the rest of the fishes and they also lack paired fins. So what you have on your Agnatha, and the example that I'm giving you here is what is called a lamprey. They will have a fin on their back, they'll have a dorsal fin, and they will also have a little bit of what is called a caudal fin or a tail fin. So they also have a posterior dorsal fin. They do not have those typical fins we see up here, the pectoral fins or the pelvic fins that we see on our more common fish. They do, however, have an eye. They have this rounded mouth where there's no jaw there. They have what is called a lateral line. Now this is something that all of your fish have and the lateral line is actually very important for fit swimming animals because it allows them to sense pressure on both sides of their body and they can tell where other fish are swimming close to them using the, sen the pressure sensitive cells in this lateral line. Now the lamprey will also have gills. Their gills are more sort of circular looking in nature, the gill slits are. You will also see that feature that is very common. But what's really interesting about the lamprey, um, or what they're most famous for, is in general they are scavengers. But there are some of these that are actually parasitic. So what I'm going to do now is sort of break out from sh doing my drawing. Um, and I'm going to take you over to a YouTube video so you can see a lamprey in action. Okay, so we are going to move right on from our Agnatha into our jawed fishes. And our jawed fishes, like I said before, are our Ostea ichthys and our Chondra ichthys. Now, all fish that have jaws have four characteristics that they share in common. One of these is that they are ectothermic. Now, ecto means outside 
or out, and therm refers to heat. So ectothermic organisms are those that rely on the environment to regulate their body temperatures, and they can even go through very long dormant periods when it's cold enough that they cannot maintain their normal bodily functions. Now, all of our fishes, our chondrichthyes and our osteichthyes will also have gills. Gills um, provide oxygenation for the blood. Blood is pumped from the heart to the gills. It's oxygenated and that blood that is carrying the oxygen then goes to the rest of the body providing oxygen for cellular processes such as cellular respiration. Now, they will also all have a skeleton. Now this skeleton can be cartilaginous or it can be bone, but they will have that and they will also have pairs of fins from the skeleton. If you remember in the agnathal we had a, um, a dorsal fin and a caudal fin, but we did not have any pairs of fins and I will show you what those look like in just a moment. And then finally all fish will have scales which are poor agnatho lacked and these help protect the skin from the environment so if you pull a scale off there's still skin underneath there the scales are on top of the skin um, and protect the skin they are not the skin itself okay so we are going to move to our chondroichthyes and our chondroichthyes are our cartilaginous fishes Sorry, that's one of those words that if I talk while I'm spelling it, it will come out all wrong. These have a cartilaginous skeleton, which means it is not made of calcified bone. And I'm going to attempt to draw one of these bad boys, so give me just a second to get this drawing going and not make a complete fool of myself. Alright, I think that's going to be a lost cause today. Let's fix that very quickly, and then we're just going to move forward with whatever comes out of this silly digital pen. I never have gotten the hang of these things. All right, so the first thing we're going to come to that's a big obvious structure is our dorsal fin. And then you'll go along the body, and they will actually sometimes have a second dorsal fin. And then you will move to a caudal fin, which, as you may remember from the agnatha, this is your tail fin. So we have our dorsal fin. We have a very unattractive caudal fin and as I'm sure you all know sharks fins are not really this ugly. And then starting back here at the head region, sharks especially have a very large pectoral fin. And I'm sure you have seen those before, and this is actually one of those paired fins that I mentioned to you earlier. The other paired fin is going to be back here at the back, and this is called a pelvic fin. And then as you travel along, they will also have an anal fin before you reach their tail. Now, the pectoral and the pelvic fins are both paired, so on the other side there is a matching fin. So if you think about it, the pectoral fins are rather homologous to our arms and the pelvic fins to our legs. This is, if you think about it, you, we have our pectoral muscles and our arms are located close to those, and then the pelvic fins will hang down more and some and, uh, cartilaginous fish are shifted further back. So we have differentiated now our chondroichthyes from our agnatha. We have the pairs of fins and we have a nice well-defined jaw. We will also have visible gill slits. And this is one of the main characteristics that makes it easy to tell a chondroichthyes from an osteoichthyes is they will actually have a cover over their gill slits so they are not visible from the outside. One of the other interesting things, and we mentioned this is true of all of our jawed fish, is that they have scales. And the scales of a shark are called denticles. And 
dent refers to teeth. So these are quite literally little teeth scales. And they always point towards the tail end, which is also called the, anybody remember? The posterior. So all these fins, I mean all these fins, all these scales point towards the posterior end of the fish. So when you rub him from posterior to anterior, he will feel like he is covered in sandpaper. And if you've ever touched a man's face, if it's been a few days since he has shaved, if you go down with the hairs, it's soft and smooth, and back up, it's rough. And this is what my daughter always comments on, is that daddy feels like sandpaper. And so that is very much the effect you're getting. When you go down the length of the scales, it is a fairly smooth sensation. And when you go up backwards, it feels more like sandpaper. Now, to make these little sandpaper scales even cooler, the shark's teeth are actually modified denticles or modified scales, and they can have up to 3,000 teeth in their mouth at once, but they only chew with the first two rows of teeth. After that, when a tooth is damaged, teeth behind it will come forward, and I believe they can have around 20 rows of teeth, but don't quote me on that. Now, our largest sharks are filter feeders. Um, they eat mainly crustaceans, small crustaceans called krill, but all sharks are predatory and they rely on their senses to catch their prey and our filter feeders have to have these senses as well. One thing they can use to help them catch prey, and you may remember this from our agnatha, is the lateral line. And this can help them sense the pressure changes in the water with those pressure sensitive cells that line this canal in the body. Something else very cool about sharks though is they can sense the electrical impulses created when our muscles move. Um, muscles move based on ele small electrical currents and the shark can actually detect these. And then the final thing And then the final thing is if something that can sense pressure and electric currents in your muscles isn't bad enough, it can smell a single drop of blood in 115 liters of water. All right, now, sharks, when it comes to their reproduction, you do have separate males and females. We do not have um, hermaphroditic sharks. So we have male and female sharks. They do mate via internal fertilization, and there is a single all-purpose opening called the cloaca. It is used for excretory, digestive, and reproductive purposes. And um, many species lay eggs, but there are also quite a few that give birth to live young. Um, and I can give you a link to a video that takes you to, I believe, was a lemon shark giving birth to her live young. But there is something very interesting that happens within the uterus occasionally of sharks that give birth to live young, and it is called intrauterine cannibalism. Let me let you digest that for just a second. Intrauterine cannibalism, and this is where the young will actually eat each other inside the mother's uterus brings a whole new perspective to asking the kids to please quit fighting in there. All right, very quickly, when the if you want when you watch the shark video of the birth of the baby sharks, you will see they do have an umbilical cord. And so that brings us to the question of do sharks have a belly button? And in the case of sharks that are born live, they will have And in the case of sharks that are born live, they will have an umbilical scar that is not quite the same as our belly button, but is from where that umbilical cord attached them to the modified placenta. Again, not like mammals have, not quite, but uh, very similar. And so you will have sharks that have a little scar there from their belly button. Isn't that cute? All right. Now, beyond are sharks. There are other chondrichthyes, and again, I will ask you to pause this video. Um, there is a video I would like for you to watch. Um, it is the manta video, if you will please go over to that for me. And when you return, I will show you one more bit of information.
Okay, I'm going to assume that you went and checked that video. Thank you if you did, and if you did not, shame on you. Pause it now and go. What I'm going to draw here is not a manta ray. What I'm drawing here is actually what's called a skate. But the important thing is that you still have these, oops, which I am drawing backwards. Just a minute. Anyway, the important thing here is that you still have these visible gill slits that help us recognize these animals as a chondroichthyes. So you'll have your five to seven rows of gill slits. They have a mouth, and they are, instead of having the large dorsal fin and large caudal fin, which they will still have a caudal fin, they actually rely largely on their pectoral fins because they have been dorso-ventrally flattened. This is their ventral side, their dorsal side. It's like you squish them going both directions. You flatten out these big pectoral fins and you end up with something that sort of resembles a ray or a skate. Now they do have a spiracle behind their eyes that they take in water. They do have a spiracle behind their eyes where they take in water for filtration. All right, this is the big point about our chondroichthyes. Make sure you understand in just a few minutes what the difference is between a chondroichthyes and an osteoichthyes. All right, moving right along, we're going to head over to our osteoichthyes. Ichthyes. Just keep telling yourself that ichthyologists study fish. You're going to be okay. Osteoichthyes, and I know these words are intimidating, but like I said, oste is bone, ichthy is fish. Now, osteoichthyes are our bony fishes. They range from 7.4 millimeters to 4 meters, and those will be your giant sturgeons. Now, they have a few physical characteristics that help differentiate them from our cartilaginous fish. Let me just try to get something that vaguely resembles a fish drawn here. He looks a little bit worried, but that'll be okay. Maybe there's a chondroichthys coming to eat him, and that's why he's concerned. It's sensing his electrical muscle impulses. And yes, I know, he looks a little funky. We'll make do. So, one of his big features that sets him apart from the chondroichthyes is there is a cover that protects the gill slits, and this is called an operculum. If you have ever seen anybody hold up a large mouth bass, and they're holding it up, showing that sucker off and that's funny looking but you get the idea and then you see these flashes of red around what we think of sometimes as being the gills and the red is actually in there are where the gills are and that covering that's flapping back and forth and back and forth is your operculum so this is going to cover the gill slits in our osteoichthyes and it is not present in our chondroichthyes now like the chondroichthyes, we will have a dorsal fin. I think I mentioned our caudal fins. They will also have pectoral fins, but these do not necessarily look quite the same way they did in our sharks. And then you will also have pelvic fins, and these are not necessarily as far away um, from the pectorals as they are in the shark. However, they do hang down more than the pectorals do. They'll be located a little further back down the body. And again, this is going to be a paired fin. There's another pectoral fin on the other side of the fish. And these are some of the structures that you need to, be able to make sure you can recognize. What I have drawn here is what is called a ray-finned fish. 
This is the most common type of osteoichthyes. We'll discuss the other type in just a minute. But these do have bony rays in their fins that give their fin structure. Now, the osteoichthyes also have some structures that are important, or other structures that are important. They have a swim bladder, which is a gas-filled sac. It helps them control the depth of them where they are swimming and also their buoyancy. I also want to look at their circulatory systems because it's a wonderful little closed circulatory system that our fish have. I'm apparently just going to draw some very worried looking fish today. Here is our new fish. Okay, so this very concerned looking guy, we're going to get him some oxygen. Let's get him to swim away from something dangerous. So what he is going to have is a heart that is located on the ventral side, and it is a two chambered heart. The first chamber the blood comes into is called the atrium. If you are familiar with human anatomy, we have two atria, and we also have two of this next part the blood flows into, which is called the ventricle. Now, sharks, uh, shark, sorry, fish have what is called a single loop closed circulatory system. And what that means is the blood flows from the atrium to the ventricle, and then it is going to go from there to the gills. In the gills, it is going to pick up oxygen, and then this oxygen-rich blood is going to be carried to the brain, and also carried throughout the rest of the fish's body. And it will come back to the atrium. Now, because this is a closed circulatory system, we don't have a hemocele where we're getting blood dumped off. We actually have what are called capillary beds, which are very small veins and arteries that help connect all the tissue of the fish to the blood supply. And so you'll have all these little finely branching areas. This is called a capillary bed. that allows gas exchange to occur throughout all the tissues of the fish. This then connects back up and carries the blood back into the heart. Now just a quick bit of terminology when we're talking about hearts is veins will always carry blood towards the heart. And your arteries will carry it away. So blood from the heart. So typically we look at it this way is that here we have an artery that is leaving, the blood is oxygenated, another artery carrying the blood down through and around the halfway point where you make that turn from leaving the heart to coming back to it, you will have um, oxygen poor blood that will then enter the atrium through a vein We've pumped into the ventricle, then pumped back out through this artery to become oxygenated again. And this just goes in a continuous cycle, being oxygenated, releasing this oxygen to the necessary organs, picking up carbon dioxide, coming back here, dropping off the carbon dioxide, picking up oxygen, and continuing through this cycle. So it goes from the heart to the lungs, to the arteries, the capillary beds, the vein, and then the heart. Now, lucky little fish that we have, they do have brains. And coming off of this brain, they will have a nerve cord. Is the nerve cord going to be located ventrally or dorsally? What kind of animal are we dealing with? It's a chordate. And chordates have their nerve cords, that's right, located dorsally. And this will be covered in vertebrae, right? They help protect it. It's not a notochord here. That's already been modified during the development. I know I shouldn't try to draw this, but we're going to try it again anyway. Oh, it's not as bad as it was the first time I gave it a shot. Here is our fish. 
buoyancy, got a nice big skull, helps protect the brain, and then you've got a spinal cord coming off of that. So that is our basic structure of our fish. There are, of course, other systems that I'm not going to ask you to worry about at this time. I'd like for you to focus on the circulatory system. We will talk about some of the others more specifically in lab and when we talk about those systems um, during the organ system unit in the class. Okay, so that was our ray fin fishes, and I promised you we'd also talk about something called a lobed fin fish. Now, lobed fin fish are special because instead of having these bony rays in their fins, they actually have more of what we think of as arm and leg bones in their fins. So in their pectoral fins, you will find bones that are very similar to our arm bones, and in their pelvic fins, you will find fin, uh, bones somewhat similar to leg bones. Um, these fleshy fins that are supported by bones are believed to have been used by lobe fin fishes, the ancestors of our modern day lobe fin fishes, to help them escape predation. Oh, he's very worried looking. Um, because the ocean is where the majority of life was during this time. And so there were lots of predators. It was very crowded. Competition was very stiff. So what the lobe fin fish would have been able to do is to use these stiff um, bone, support, uh, bone supported fins for actually sort of pulling themselves along in very shallow water and possibly even to scuttle between uh, bodies of water that are very close to each other. Along the move from one body of water to another, if competition got too stiff, if feeding was um, insufficient, or if predation got too heavy. And so it is believed that this is where he made the transition from water to land. That the low fin fish are what led us to our amphibians. So just very quickly, the transitional form of the lobe fin fish, that is sort of, you can think of like the missing link between the lobe fin fish and the salamanders had a shoulder, which was connected to a humerus, which is what we have for an upper arm bone. And then there were two more smaller bones connected to this, which we also have the radius and the ulna. And then there are some various small bones here that help finalize the structure of the fin. Then we also had an ancestral amphibian, which is going to connect for us just one moment. Let me draw something not just terrible here, or at least, you know, debatable. This is our ancestral amphibian. He's going to be a little bit happier than our lobe fin fish was. He will also have a shoulder. And his shoulder is connected to his humerus. Which is connected, crazy as it may sound, to a radius and an ulna. And then he has more accessory bones which help make up the fingers of our salamanders and our toes perhaps of our salamanders and our frogs. So this is one of our big commonalities here between the lobe been fish and the amphibians are these bony structures that are believed to have been the predecessors to these terrestrial legs. Now amphibians have four characteristics that define them. One is they do have four limbs and so they are called tetrapods. 
pods. Pods. Tetra meaning four and pods meaning feet. They are four-footed animals. Um, all of our salamanders, all of our salamanders, gracious, all of our amphibians either have four legs or they have a common ancestor who did have four legs, as in the case with our sacilians, which we'll get to in just a little bit. All salamanders also have skin that is smooth, it has no scales, and it has mucus glands that help maintain its moisture that are also involved in water balance and are really, really important for respiration. And it also helps them regulate their body temperature and avoid drying out, also known as desiccation. Now, the way they go through respiration is rather unique. Amphibians, when they are immature, have gills like a fish does. And then as they grow into an adult, they go through metamorphosis and they develop weak lungs, though some adults do still have gills. And what's really fascinating is that gas exchange occurs between the skin that is sufficient to allow them to survive when they bury themselves in moist soil like they do during the winter during their dormant periods. So they aren't breathing with their lungs when they're buried underground. They are breathing through their skin. All right, the next interesting a uh, characteristic I want you to be aware of is the circulatory system of amphibians. They have a three-chambered heart and that three and they also have a closed double loop circulatory system. And let me just show you very quickly what that is going to look like. It's one of the major um, systems I'm going to ask you to know at this point for the amphibians. So if you are familiar with human anatomy, again, some of this may sound a little bit familiar. Amphibians, like our sharks, have a heart that includes an atrium. And this will lead to a ventricle. But in the case of the amphibians, we have a three-chambered heart, and so we actually have a second atrium on this side. We have a left and a right atrium. This is my frog heart. So this is going to be our right atrium, because we look at the side of the animal, not our left and right, it's the animal's left and right. This is our left atrium. This is the ventricle. And the way this works, and I'll show you some more details in just a minute, but blood will come into the right atrium and the left atrium. Both of these, the blood is pumped into the ventricle when the atrium contract. And then when the ventricle contracts, all of this blood is pushed up through this artery, up and out of the heart. Now, there is a combination here of blood that is rich, rich in oxygen and poor in oxygen. And there is a little bit of mixing that occurs, but in general, it is not a thorough mixing that occurs in the ventricle before it is pumped up and out. Now, I want to show you an overview of how this heart sort of fits into the whole puzzle of a frog's um, circulatory system. We'll see how ridiculous my frog can look. He's got some really big thighs and a really big belly, which in all honesty is pretty typical of a frog. All right, so there's my frog. So what we're going to have is I'm not going to draw all the parts of the heart again, but there is the frog's heart. You're going to have that major artery come out. This is coming out of the ventricle is going to branch and go three different directions. One set of branches goes towards the head. One set is going to go towards these sort of underdeveloped puny little lungs. And then from that you will have another artery branch off and go over here closer to the skin where the real action is. Uh, there's more oxygen to be gathered there quite often than in the lungs. And then you will have a final part, and this is all going to be my artery. But I'm going to show you this one because I want you to see the shape. 
then the final branches come together to form something very similar to a heart shape. And this vein will run down the frog's body. It will take blood to his digestive tract. It will also take blood to his legs. Now, this blue and red coloration I'm using can be a little bit deceptive. I just want you to be able to sort of see what I'm doing as we come back up so the lines don't get too tangled. Oxygen is being dropped off. If these arteries go close to the skin, they may actually pick up oxygen and bring it back with them. These veins and arteries also take cellular waste to the kidneys and take filtered blood back out of the kidneys. And then all of this blood that has come from the system will come back in here at the right ventricle. And then you will have blood that has come. See, this is where it gets tricky. You will have blood that has come from the skin that comes into the left ventricle from this lung will come to the left ventricle and the skin on this side and from the lung on this side. So all of the blood that went out specifically to the skin to pick up oxygen or to the lungs comes back in the left ventricle. You have blood pumped in from the right and blood pumped in from the left and then oops I grabbed the wrong colors I apologize and this will be pumped up and out to the artery to go back to that same system again and I just realized that I forgot to bring blood in from the head okay but so you will have blood coming back into the heart to be pumped back out again. The, the blood that has gone through the system to take blood um, bearing nutrients and oxygen in other parts of the body will come back into the right atrium. The blood that has gone out to the skin and the lungs come back, comes back into the left atrium. They are both pumped into the ventricle then sent out into the body through the vein and when they uh, through the artery and when they come back in they are coming back in via veins because as we mentioned before veins bring blood back to the heart while arteries take it away okay now while this system is great it is not used to help keep the animal warm in any way um, metabolism does not aid amphibians in moderating their temperatures they do rely on the environment for that and so another one of their seven characteristics is that they are ectothermic. One of the others that is important to remember about the amphibians, they have very well developed sense organs. They have great sight, hearing, smell, and they even have specialized tongues. If you've ever seen a frog try to catch a fly, you have seen that lovely little thing in action. They also have, and this is their seventh characteristic, aquatic reproduction, uh, typically. They have external fertilization, with eggs and sperm in the water. The young will develop into larvae with gills, which are also called tadpoles. And they will have a head and a tail-like structure. And they're going to look more like a tiny fish creature. And they will have gills and a small mouth. And what will happen is they will actually go through metamorphosis and they'll start developing legs and their tails will start shrinking and eventually you will end up with a frog or a salamander that has matured into adult no longer in the case of frogs has a tail and loses the gills and they are replaced as very weak lungs and these are typically more land dwelling organisms for our diversity of our amphibians we have some that are what we think of as being sort of lizard-like and if you've ever grabbed a lizard and it was really slimy it may be that you picked up an amphibian by mistakes. There are salamanders and newts there which are, are lizard-like in appearance. They're 15 centimeters to 1.5 meters long and they are predatory. If you would like to see a video, or I encourage you to stop what you're doing and go watch the video, I have a video of um, a blind salamander 
from Eastern Europe that I encourage you to go watch. Its name is a Proteus. Uh, my brother actually is currently living in the Czech Republic and he went on vacation and brought my children back little stuffed Proteuses which they now sleep with at night. My children are probably the only children in the United States who sleep with stuffed blind salamanders. But anyway, they're not real. They are plush, by the way. So you have salamanders and newts. Then you have your frogs and toads. These have modified back legs that specialize for jumping. Some of these are poisonous, like your poison dart frog. And they can range from 1 centimeter to 30 centimeters, and they are all carnivorous. And then finally, we have our Sicilians. These are worm-like in appearance. They're sightless and legless, and they range from 10 centimeters to over a meter long. And these are typically found in very moist soils, and many of us do not ever get to see a Sicilian. Certainly the most common amphibian that we all see on a regular basis are the frogs and toads. Okay, well that concludes our lecture on the fishes and the amphibians. If you have any questions, please let me know. Please make sure you watch the videos that um, from YouTube that go along with this lecture. You will be responsible for that material. And if you have any questions, please let me know.